Yeah, so this is great that you organized this event and I'm glad uh, many of you could uh, come here and uh, we will be doing, I guess during this workshop, we will sort of grow together and share interdisciplinary work uh, on internet-based research. I'm going to focus today a little bit on uh, how we can do the research with social media and a little bit on big data. And tomorrow I will talk uh, more about techniques for internet-based experimenting and the number of tools that you could use for that. And also come back to any like open threads that might come up while we have our presentations. Also, Kimberly and I uh, thought about the format a little bit, and if you have any questions while uh, I am presenting, I'll be happy to answer those and we can have discussions. We have plenty of time overall, so we hope we get a discussion going and maybe develop some new ideas. Just briefly about my group, um, the iScience group. We've been doing this kind of research since the mid-90s. So, as you know, the technologies constantly change and new methodologies need to be developed. So, we, we've been focusing on the second point here. How can we use the Internet? That's sort of the overall uh, term that includes many services, as you know, and now includes social media. Uh, how can we use the Internet to conduct studies? and then studies in the various uh, methodologies that we have known for long in the behavioral sciences, like experiments, surveys, non-reactive data collection, apps, tests, and so on. Uh, so that's like the main focus, but of course we've also done some studies on the psychology of the internet. Um, so how does communication change with internet services, anonymity, you know, privacy is a very hot topic, very important, and uh, social exchange and so on. This is our website, so if you want to look up some of the resources um, I'm going to talk about, you could find them here uh, on this page with the picture of the Alps. <laughs> and we have a Facebook page, of course, that you could like. Uh, yeah, so overall what happened, uh, as many of you experience yourself, we are the generation, the only generation. Some of you here in the audience are of a newer generation, but many of us are the only generation that experienced the time before the internet, or actually the use of the internet in, in science and is now experiencing the time when we have the internet. So we can do the comparison, right? Future generations will not be able to do that. And we also experienced another revolution, that was the computer revelation. revolution in the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, right? So what happened is we have a study methodology in the behavioral sciences, we had a revolution with the computers, end of the 60s, you could suddenly do things like branching in surveys. So depending on the answer people would give to a question, you could uh, deliver different uh, uh, next questions. Uh, and you could do response time measurement, for example, easily, more easily than before. So we had that revolution, and then now we have a third revolution, that's the internet revolution with networking, uh, access to many people, um, participants in different societies and in large numbers. So we, what we hope, I guess we all share these hopes here in the audience, uh, we might be able to develop better methods and get impulses for new applications that we can use and develop then uh, ways to get results more quickly and maybe more solidly discover new areas that we couldn't do research before. And uh, Kimberly, for example, is working on a project uh, how to use crowdsourcing 
to analyze uh, data from that were collected a long time ago, and it's just so, ma so much that it cannot be done easily uh, without something like crowdsourcing. We offer this portal here with a number of tools that can be used in research, and I will uh, come back to some of these uh, tools uh, later and also tomorrow in the tutorial. So if you want to bookmark this uh, link, iScience.eu, you will find um, a number of tools here. Now for the tutorial tomorrow, uh, I would like you to go to wexter.org and sometime today sign up there, get an account and uh, create a login that begins with IRV15. We will need that tomorrow. Uh, you will get an email and I just want to make sure that there's enough time so you get your login for that. Okay, on to social media. So, uh, demographic data or uh, surveys show that um, more and more people are now using social media and we're at uh, more than 80% now. So, <coughs> for research uh, that and also research um, that uh, is to be done with populations like the U.S. population, representative studies and so on. Um, that means that it's now possible and interesting to use social media in research. What are social media? Here is a little picture of many social media uh, types that are out there, many services. So if we talk about social media, many people start thinking, oh, Facebook, maybe Twitter, and then for many people it ends, but there are many, many social services and you can do uh, different things with them. There's social TV, for example, social intelligence, blogging platforms, social shopping. Um, and you could think about all of these services, of course, um, as possible social networks where you could do research, right? Um, people have been trying to categorize the different social media um, along the functions they provide, like micro microblogging, discussions, publishing, virtual worlds, and so on. So, um, if we want to do research with social media, we can uh, select from all of these platforms. The advantages of social media uh, in research compared to previous internet-based research are that uh, these data are richer than previous internet data. So we can look at social behavior, movement data, you know, there's geolocation information with, with much of the data we get from social media. The pure size of the corpora, these are data mountains which can be nice, but also it can be challenging, and we're going to look a little bit at big data research. Um, then the ease of access to temporal development, so timelines, let think of timelines in uh, Facebook, for example, and the ease of access to different samples that precisely meet certain target characteristica, so you can, uh, for example, with fa Facebook, you can zoom in on pre very precisely on particular demographic slices and locations and so on. So social media turn into interesting sources and uh, one of the early examples um, by David Crandall and colleagues at Cornell, uh, what they did is they downloaded 35 million geotagged pictures from Flickr the photo sharing website and just uh, place dots in a white space where these pictures were taken and recreated basically the world map. So wherever there is a dot and you see high densities here, uh, picture, 
pictures were taken, or one picture was taken. And so with these data, what you can do is basically see uh, interesting uh, spots like the Apple Store in New York is among the top ten. <coughs> of course, people like to take pictures of the sea, so we see the coastlines. And uh, we also see some people apparently being on ships over here. So that's one use that can be used in uh, city planning and tourism and so on. Another uh, social medium is Twitter. Uh, may I ask who is using Twitter? Right. So uh, for those who don't know, this is basically a service where you can uh, send short messages and these short messages can include um, links and pictures and you can resend uh, the messages, you can follow people who are sending these messages and it's basically um, a message that you send out will be sent to all the people um, who follow you. And we developed this tool called iScience Maps that's available from this URL um, to research Twitter content. And this is how the tool looks like. Um, there are two types of search. One is a global search and one is a, a local search. It is targeted as, at researchers, so when we developed this tool, it uh, was the case that uh, there were only like basic search engines for Twitter content. Twitter offered one itself and there were some others. But what wasn't around was comparative search. So now uh, in, with this tool you can do comparative search by location and use Boolean operators like AND, OR and so on uh, to do the searches. We also wanted to visualize the results and uh, develop little uh, videos, basically animated sequences of how um, the, the Twitter space evolved uh, given the search terms you would put in. Um, we also, because Twitter kept changing their policies about uh, you know, the data they would offer to researchers, we wanted to build a Twitter independent database. So we're um, harvesting about 5 to 10 percent of all tweets um, and collect them. And uh, the download of the results can be done using different formats. So first, the global search, um, you would type in any search terms. You could add more here by uh, clicking here. So if you would have uh, two terms you wanted to look for, um, you add some other information here, like how many intervals you would like to have in the results, and it allows them uh, or, or creates then these world maps where you see how often was a word or the search was tweeted um, where in the world and you can go to any of the dots and then see where was this and how many tweets were there and as you can see down here you know this can be played as a little video so you see how the the frequency of tweets uh, in the various places evolved over time. So to test how we can use uh, these Twitter data using this tool um, in research, we did this study on effective and personality characteristics from inferred from first names. Uh, we looked up an original study by Merabian and Piercy done in Los Angeles, 1993. Um, and we wanted to replicate this via Twitter, via the internet rather than paper and pencil as they did in the original study. So the original study was done locally in LA with local students and 
thinking about first names and what people attribute to it, you would think that maybe there is something, you know, certain culture, certain attributes locally in LA that might not generalize to the rest of the English-speaking world, right? Or maybe it does. You probably <coughs> know a lot, Patricia, about uh, what to expect there, you know, would it generalize or not? Anyway, we ex assumed that um, using the internet we could get the results quickly and probably independent of such local sampling effects. So from uh, their article we took the first names they used and uh, the six, first six male names were Alexander, Charles, and Kenneth that in their results were connotated to the dimension successful. Um, and three other names, Otis, Tyrone, Wilbur, this connection was weak, right? So uh, successful also, you know, it meant ambitious, intelligent, and creative. So the question was, would we replicate these attributions to these names uh, via the internet. If these names have those connotations of a personality characteristic, uh, then this should also show up in Twitter data, right? Because you would expect that you would find more instances of um, attributions to persons like Charles is an intelligent guy that they would appear more frequently in Twitter than uh, the opposite ones. Oops. So what we did is we defined two locations to do a comparison. So the Western US and UK and Ireland defined a date range. So we took all the tweets within the database from the last three days. Uh, and first we um, just did a search for each name to later adjust for the base rate of the frequency of the names. And then we did searches using our tool uh, for each name in combination with each of the attributes, for example, Charles and Intelligent. This is how it looks like in the tool. So on the left side you see uh, this area, rough area of the Western United States, and on the right, the area of UK and Ireland. And we had the same terms in here, like Charles and Intelligent, the three-day uh, time window. And as you can see, you know, many people are surprised. There are only very few tweets, right? So like eight for all of the UK and Ireland over a span of three days. So the results were supporting the original findings for male names in the US. We didn't find a single combination of the low connotation names with any of the terms successful, ambitious, intelligent, and creative. But all the high connotation names did indeed appear in the same tweets with some of the terms. For example, Alexander appeared six times with either creative or successful. Kenneth was tweeted 15 times in combination with successful and Charles 38 times with creative, intelligent, or successful. Question. Yep. I'm coming to that, yes. So I'm coming to that. So um, it first, it all replicated uh, for the UK and Ireland. So there were no tweets for the combinations of the four personality characteristics with the low connotation names, but again, some combinations for two of the three high connotation names. But um, as was just, I guess that's where you wanted to go. Um, critically, the base rate of the high connotation names um, was a confounding factor, apparently, because Alexander, Kenneth, and Charles appear generally much more often in the Twitter space, and the low connotation names Otis, Tyrone, and Wilbur 
much less frequently, right? And so, for example, what could have happened is that some people just don't know the low commutation name, so they don't have any commutations, right? Um, and so, um, this is a, cr a critical issue that we were able to show with this study. Um, and, sorry, and so um, this has to be, um, yeah, this has to be criticized in the original study already. You know, so it's highly confounded with the base weight. Yes? Right, so that's what we can do and what we actually do is it with the tool, you can get all the original tweets and you can look at them. And in this case, there were not too many tweets, so you can describe every of the tweets. And we also look for automated tweets. There are many companies now sending out sort of general tweets that are not on an individual level. And you can uh, look at all of those. And you can also look uh, how many tweets were actually doing something, you know, s saying something opposite. So like Charles is not intelligent, right? Uh, and you can look at all of those. Yes, so uh, the Prince Charles um, hypothesis is, you know, was true for very few tweets, but it's of course one of the reasons why Charles was uh, prominent. But yeah, the names are just, um, they are used very differently. They have different frequencies. And using Twitter um, to determine actually how often are names tweeted, uh, that's already, I think, quite interesting, you know, how frequently. Yeah, I have an idea for controlling for base weight. I wonder if you've thought of this, which is to then look at the um, association with negative qualities right. and look at the, whether the proportion, the ratio of positive to negative differs, right. which then controls for the absolute frequency. Yes. Yeah. So we can, uh, all in those cases also where we have uh, Charles is not intelligent, we could include or those. Charles is yes. stupid. Yes. Uh, I don't know if uh, Moravia was actually my colleague in the psychology department. I don't know if in his article mm -hmm. um, he, uh, well, yeah, he said he also has the, the low. Low uh, connotation names, yes. Well, low connotation, but does he also have the high connotation he with didn't. negative qualities? No, he didn't look at the. But you could add that. Yes, I mean, even yes. just by taking answers. Right, yes. And yeah. I think that would, um, you know, that would really do it for controlling for base rate. Right. Yes? Just a question about the tool. So when you, when you do the searches, are you, to what extent, are you able to sort of do a search and sort of then extract some of the raw data from the Twitter? Or yes. You, or is, it just, is it just summary sort of things that you can get out of it? No, you get the original tweets, actually. So uh, there is a result table. I'm sorry I don't have a slide here, but if you go online and use the tool, just do a quick search, you will see it. Um, so there is a result table and you can download uh, all the data in different formats like for Excel, CSV and so on. Uh, and you can click on the results and then go directly to the original tweets on Twitter. So it's very good for also for qualitative analyses. So you can take all the original tweets that you found and then do further analyses with those. Yes? Uh, 
Yes, you can. You get the information um, of the person that tweeted the tweet, right? And then you could click on on that person's tweet account and then see um, who is this person following and who is following this person, right? And then you could uh, use that information, of course, to see within the da your database or your data of interest whether there are any connections. Yeah. I have a question, a technical question from mm -hmm. a technically unsophisticated person. How, um, how did you get access? How does your, um, your program, or whatever you call it, uh, get access to all the tweets? Do you have like a special arrangement with Twitter, or what's the way? No, we don't. Or okay. can anybody yeah. do that if they just you know, were clever? Mm -hmm. Very good question. So this has been one of the major issues with many of us who wanted to do research with tweets, that Twitter first was uh, not open at all to external research. And we tried, we had a connection even to you know, some of the founders of Twitter and they explicitly stated at the World Wide Web conference in Barcelona they are not going to collaborate with researchers. However, one year later, they opened up and they created um, you know, ways for researchers to access the tweets. Um, so you can get an arrangement or you could use other services like Data Sift is a company that sells um, <coughs> tweets um, to get data. However, you know, things have been changing like every few months basically uh, and so our tool um, we did two things one is we collected public ava publicly available tweets right in our own database that we provide for the global search and that is you know it's public information and of course you can collect it and create a database from it um, so so that's one route and the other one is that we are using the um, user's web browser, basically. The user's web browser connects to the Twitter database. And um, currently, Twitter limits it to a certain number of searches within a 15-minute period. So you might run into limits if you do a lot of searches. But that's the current state, right? And Twitter is changing it once in a while. Um, so. So this sort of using the, the user's uh, web access um, allows us to provide the service in a way that uh, it is not blocked by, by Twitter. Because um, you know, any site where you access the, the Twitter database a lot is in danger of being blocked. Many of the uh, data providers do that. Google does that too. You know, some people, uh, some researchers have been blocked you know, by accessing their databases too, too frequently. Maybe some of you ran into those problems too. I don't know. Yes? Uh, no, I just have a couple of questions. Uh -huh. um, first one is, uh, uh, what do you establish connotations between uh, the, uh, the name and the tweets? Is it term frequency or is it is uh, fr pure frequency within the same tweet. Okay. Of words. Yes. Or, okay. And then the other question is, you know, Twitter is basically a small subset of people that may communicate about anything. Mm -hmm. How do you do research on Twitter in general? Very good question, and I'm going to come back to that later on here. So each social medium service or each social medium um, has a particular audience, right? So doing the research in Twitter might not mean you could generalize it to the general population, right? Yes. Okay, I'm going to go on. <coughs> so another service that you might want to consider uh, using is Topsy, and they currently have access to all the tweets until, until very early and it's uh, freely available. As we have been uh, learning, you know, we don't know how long it will hold, 
Twitter changes the um, sorry. Twitter changes the policies all the time, uh, but currently this service provides you with various options. So you could look at all the tweets, let's say the past seven days, past 30 days, or all time. Um, like here, I looked for WikiLeaks and not Obama, and you can see that they go back very far, eight years ago and so. And you could look also for tweets containing pictures or videos in different languages and so on. So this is currently another service that's very useful. Yes. So when you do this search, you get this glitching effect. Is it possible to save these things or how, how does one try to work with them once, once you get them off? Yes. So you could uh, do this and then serve the te text directly, do more processing. But many of those websites uh, also have APIs, uh, application programming interfaces, and you could write programs um, to directly access these interfaces and then download the data in batches and so on. Yeah. So this is some uh, stuff other people have been doing um, with tweets. For example, this is uh, in political science where they simply looked at a number of terms. Um, you could click here, let's say on environment, and then map this onto um, the, the map of the United States in this case. So this is a, a map, a cardo area cartogram that uh, takes into account the different population densities in different states and so on. And so you would see you know, how many people in what area of the United States would actually tweet about jobs, right, or about immigration and so on. So this is something uh, you can do from uh, harvesting or from getting Twitter data. Or here an example from psychology, people were looking at the mood throughout the day as inferred from tweets and uh, you would see here you know changes from six seven o'clock eight o'clock nine o'clock and so on um, the mood gets more angry and then <laughs> calms down and so on On to Facebook, we've been doing some <coughs> research on uh, the personality trait of narcissism and how it can be inferred from Facebook profiles or um, how you would um, detect narcissism on Facebook profiles. So narcissism, we found in this research, predicts that people would have more friends, more wall posts, more self-promoting info. I mean, it's, that's relatively obvious, right? Um, and more attractive pictures and so on. But we also found that if uh, we ask people, you know, to look at profiles and then make an assumption of how narcissistic is this person, um, we are pretty good at that. So um, from these factors, we're pretty good at predicting whether somebody is actually narcissistic. So I this, a yes. A narcissism, um, um, assessment. Yes. So what we uh, did in this case is, and I recommend this for the small, uh, smaller studies, we asked participants to um, give us access to their Facebook profiles. Uh, and we had Facebook profiles that we would then also give to others to look at and then um, you know, make attributions, answer survey questions about it. Um, so you're giving the people who give you the access the, um, something like the narcissism yes, scale? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> That's how it works. So how do you quantify these things? You're just things like, how do you quantify how sexy a picture is or, or things like this, this was done with raters, so we would uh, give people that show them the pictures and they make ratings, uh, how attractive is this, and then you have several raters and you have inter-rater agreement, and then that way you can determine you know, how attractive, for example, is a, is a picture. Is not by humans, not by 
yes, this is done by humans. But then, of course, you could also do um, large-scale research, and there are the first uh, groups who do that. So, for example, there is one group that uh, collects, uh, asks, simply asks people, um, do you want to take part in our research, and then um, gets access, if they agree to uh, give their data, their Facebook data, to the researchers. Um, they get access to the profile and they automatically <coughs> download it. And there are now a number of uh, services, like this is a Danish initiative. It's called Digital Footprints. If you look it up on the web, you will find it. Um, this is geared to full academics, so nobody else uh, can use it. And you have to apply um, there, but it's an easy application. And what they will do is they will then um, allow you to uh, invite participants. You could do that like you always do in, in research studies, right? You find uh, a sample and invite these people, and they would have to agree to um, provide their Facebook profiles basically to your research. And if they know this is only for fully academic research, they are more likely to do that, of course. And then um, if, they, if the participants give their consent, then the data are automatically retrieved <coughs> and can then be searched, uh, sorted, and filtered, and you can do uh, the follow-up statistics. And this um, service is open to everybody um, who is a full academic. There is another uh, tool here is called Discover Text, and <coughs> it's uh, free in a trial version. It has some advanced features, but you know if you want to do really large-scale studies, uh, they have a license fee, and uh, so that that will cost something. Basically, what um, you can do with this tool is you can access all public posts. Many people um, post publicly on Facebook, and this can be searched, and the tool will do this for you. Or you can um, create a Facebook account and link with many people you find interesting, and then this tool can help you getting all the data from all the profiles that are linked to your own profile, right? Um, because that's the privacy um, limitation Facebook uh, puts in. You can only access those that uh, open their data to your account, your Facebook account. Pardon? Yes. So that's if they agree to have to give the data to you, to your profile, then you can access the data, right? Okay. Okay, good. So that changed also then, you know. Okay. Well, here's another tool um, where they access public pages that also have Facebook accounts like the White House or the New York Times. And so this is from Rutgers. And you can um, then get all the, the comments to um, things they post on the site and on Facebook. So this is available from, from this address. And there is another tool called NetViz um, that allows you similar things with the limitations that were just mentioned. So for many of these tools that retrieve data from uh, Facebook, 
you will have to have some kind of link and permissions um, from the prof or the owners of the profiles um, that where you want to get the data from, right? Yes. Right. More Absolutely. Yes. Is there research on the bias in our brain in this context? Not yet, but we know from logic mm -hmm. that it's very likely. Yes. Can you select certain ages when you, um, you know, when you're recruiting? Because uh, we do a lot with teens, mm -hmm. basically, and we've done something like this, but manually recruiting one by one, and this would be a fantastic tool to, to recruit more en masse, mm -hmm. and can, but can you do that, ask people to consent and say between certain ages? Yes, so what, what you can easily look at is the age they give in their Facebook profile, but then that might not always be a, the true age, right? So people might, you know, well, give we know different... We've yeah. done research on that, so we yeah. know what... Exactly. That kids try to be a little older mm -hmm. at the teen years, um, but mostly you get actual teens. Right. But but do you? I mean, from what you're saying, it sounds like anybody, like you wouldn't be asking just for teens. You'd be asking for anyone, and then you'd make the selection. I was wondering if you could just ask for teens, and then of course you would check with their. Facebook profile and get rid of the ones that were, you know, reported different ages. Yes. So uh, in this, like in the small scale studies we talked about earlier, where we actually have face-to-face uh, -face contact with the participants, we could um, find other ways to determine their age, of course. Have them show the ID, for example, and so on, and make really sure. And then the next step is um, you know, harvesting data from a profile we create and that is connected to many and people volunteering to give their data. Um, and there we would have the information that they would give within Facebook. So it's a bit, a bit less um, uh, sure whether the information is right. And then also you could buy directly from Facebook um, demographic data about users um, and then, you know, do correlations within that. So those are the three ways and maybe somebody can add to that about other ways. But you can't put out an announcement, say, asking for teenagers only. Yes, you could. You could uh, do recruitment elsewhere, you know, and ask people to sign up for the research and there you could specify um, we are looking for teenage people between the ages of, and so on. And, and where would the elsewhere be? Um, there are many places where you could. Internet? It could be on the internet. It could be offline. It could be, for example, you distribute flyers in movie theaters. Uh, you know, many. There are many ways of recruiting participants, and then asking them for their Facebook information, their profile. Yeah. Yes. Come, come again, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, the European Union changed uh, the privacy uh, regulations. And of course, in all social media, we have the, the basic issue that people are posting information on their own accounts and profiles. Um, that also include information about other people, right? So let's say you uh, take a picture of you with a group of friends, then you upload the picture to Facebook, and then you tag these other people, right? So you're not only publishing information about yourself, which would be perfectly fine to then say, okay, I don't care, anybody could see my picture, but you're also posting information about these other people who are also on the picture, right? And the European Union, um, therefore, 
limited recently in a, in a high court um, uh, decision, you know, limited uh, how, f you know, how far can these data be uh, spread and how can they be used in, in commerce and in research. However, for research purposes, things are uh, a little bit better because it's recognized that research is generally for the well-being of everybody. And so um, this really depends on the local regulations then of your university and the state you're in within the European Union. And it will be trickling down from this high court decision uh, towards the local regulations in, in the future. So we expect that it will be becoming more difficult to do the type of research we want to do, but currently there are still many options and there are a number of other tools that um, I will be happy to, dis to distribute the slides and you can look up these tools as well. Or you could buy the data from a number of vendors and they sell the data for analysis. I mentioned data sift before, GNIP. There are other <coughs> tools here, um, other sites where you could buy data. Now we already talked about some challenges with data collection <coughs> in social media. And one uh, that was also mentioned before is sampling biases. And some people did this uh, nice analysis of more likely Obama voters versus more likely Romney voters and low political engagement versus high political engagement. And uh, the question was, where would you find uh, people within social networks? And it, Facebook tends to be sort of being in the middle, but if you want to do research on the blogging website Tumblr, for example, you would uh, have a higher chance of ending up with more likely Obama voters who have a low political engagement. Or if you do research uh, on eBay, there has been some excellent research on eBay, you might end up with more likely Romney voters who have a higher political engagement, right? So choosing the social medium we're going to do the research in already uh, brings with it a certain selection of people. And yeah. yes? How do you figure out whether somebody is a Romney voter or, or Obama? <coughs> um, well, this was the methodology behind this. Um, is, of course, something you could discuss. Um, they used Facebook likes. Um, and determined, you know, there are certain posts by the Romney campaign, for example, you know, so people who like those more frequently are more likely Romney voters and so on. But I think the principle is, um, is obvious. And so if we want to do research with social media, we need to choose social networks. And here is a website that allows you to choose a social network. There, as I mentioned before, there are very many small social networks for different purposes. And this is in, in Germany, uh, one site, but there are similar sites, I'm sure, around in English. So here you would choose uh, an age group and whether and the gender, and then um, some topics um, that you are interested in, let's say health, or education, uh, and then you, if you pick these examples, the tool will spit out several social networks you could do your research in, in this case here. Um, I picked education and a certain age group, and uh, so I could then go to these social networks and try accessing the data and do my research. Okay. Excuse me. So on to Social Lab. I have very few minutes left. So um, this is a tool because of the many problems we talked about with um, Twitter and Facebook does the same. So any social network that's owned by a private company 
Um, we as researchers, we cannot control what they are really doing. We don't know all the algorithms. We don't know if they offer us to um, use certain data. They control uh, the data and we don't, often don't really know when they are going to make changes. So if we plan a research project for three years and Twitter changes the policies, right, uh, we might not be able to do the project. So I think it's high time for us to develop our own social media. And this is what we tried to do with Social Lab. This was published in Behavior Research Methods. Uh, and you can also go to the site sociallab.es and um, you know, look at the, the stuff there. It's open source, so you could download it and use it, reprogram it, add features. And it is a, a tool to build your own social network laboratory. Um, you can customize it. And a nice thing it has are these social bots. So there are agents within the social network that can do certain tasks. They appear like participants uh, and they can, for example, contact other users and ask them to befriend them. And we created some example uh, sites, social engineering war games, we call them, where people can learn about how to protect their privacy within such social networks and it relies very much on um, this is the sign up process I'm gonna <coughs> jump over this um, and then you can um, basically try you get these tasks and you uh, try to um, befriend in this case a person named Alice Johnson Alice Johnson is a bot so it's, it's an agent within the social network and it will um, either respond or not and you can try convincing this person to befriend you. So these agents, they are stateful for the computer scientists among you. Uh, it means that they basically have a memory so they remember past interactions with other users and react on, on the basis of those memories also. And these networks um, and bots, they allow systematic experimental variation within the social network. So we can ask um, a bot to do certain things uh, with certain users and other things with other users. Uh, they are relatively easy to program and they appear mostly like human users. So our example networks that you could also use uh, and sign up to try it out is um, they have these many users and the English version is this address. And it's free, so help yourself and, and use it. Now, uh, just one last thing I would like to mention is um, that the internet had an impact in many sciences. I mean, this meeting is uh, proof of it, you know, with people from different disciplines. And um, early on already we had examples <coughs> from biology. This is a garden, the telegarden. Anybody knows this one? was around in the 90s already um, in LA where people could access the garden via the internet and then move a camera over certain plants and then make decisions like we need to water this plant and it was all done automatically you know, from all over the world. Uh, and this has evolved to now what is called citizen science so there, is large there are these large-scale websites. One is Zooniverse, uh, where w people, researchers, invite the public to take part in science projects. Uh, so there are, you know, astronomy projects, there are history projects, um, and 
humanities projects. So for example, the project uh, Kimberly is working on, right, could be one of the projects on these sites and people are invited uh, to take part and it turns out many people from the general public like to get involved and for example do some categorization tasks and help uh, in, in tasks for science projects. You can, uh, there are projects where you observe animals, take pictures, upload pictures of the animals and so on. Good. So um, I'm going to come back to the big data stuff tomorrow in um, the tutorial a little bit. And I know, for example, Patricia will present something on uh, Google Ngram research. And uh, so I'm going to conclude at this point. Thank you.